constellations have names. People looked up and they saw patterns in the sky and they recognized the patterns. And so they, they named those patterns. They named the patterns uh, generally after things that they kind of like sort of, you know, looked like or wanted them to look like. Uh, named patterns that were close enough that they could recognize them as something uh, as part of a story or mythology. There were various reasons they named the different constellations what they did. They also named the stars. Uh, a bright star in a particular constellation, they didn't want to say that, that bright star there, they wanted to give a name to it. And so the names actually, you know, were kind of, uh, some of the stars were named uh, themselves individually. Uh, for example, the star Capella was, was bright enough that actually got a name after a mythological character herself. And then others were named uh, in likewise fashion as to what they looked like. Uh, uh, the names, you know, were, were reminiscent of, of something. Um, so, uh, and some of them were named after where they were in a constellation. Uh, for example, uh, the star uh, Deneb. You know, if you look at uh, Cygnus the Swan, Remember, you know, it looks like a big cross. That's supposed to be a swan here. That's the nose of the bird right there, okay? Uh, uh, and that star is called Albirio, which means in Arabic, nose of the bird. And that star right there is called Deneb, and Deneb means tail. Okay. And so the problem is that's not a very unique way of naming things because there's a lot of mythological creatures in the sky that the constellations represent. And so a big star near the tail was often called Deneb. Uh, the tail of the lion was called Denebula to indicate his tail of the lion. But this was not a great way of doing it. Nonetheless, this was the, the uh, basis behind uh, what we call the proper names of stars. Okay. And so in Orion, that star right there was called Betelgeuse, which means armpit. That star right there was called Rigel, which comes from the Arabic and it means foot. And so the star names were very much uh, 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 in, in keeping with kind of what they were, were thinking was, was, was should have been uh, uh, what was what in the constellation. Uh, Problem is there's lots of Rigels in the sky because a lot of these creatures have feet. So they'd sometimes say Rigel, the big Rigel. There's one that's almost as bright, this Rigel in Centaurus, the Centaur. So they call that Rigel Centaurus, meaning for the Centaur. Uh, uh, Sirius uh, means the scorching one. That's where we get searing from. And the star Algol uh, is short for Al Rash Al Ghul, uh, Arabic for head of the demon. So that, that star represented the... Uh, 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 head of Medusa. Other stars have particular names. Uh, Polaris is actually a Latin name uh, for the pole star. And Teres is a Greek name. Uh, um, uh, I told you that that, that star, the star is kind of reddish down to the south, which is almost the color of the planet Mars. Well, Mars is the Roman god of war. Ares was the Greek god of war. So that's Ares we have ant or anti or rival of or, or contra to, you know, ant means opposing to uh, uh, antagonist, for example. Uh, so that's how you break up that word. Okay, so ant Ares or antares means rival of Mars. So a rival of Aries, literally. And so that star is the same color and brightness as the planet Mars in the sky. And so these are what we refer to as the proper names of stars. Okay, so these are the common names that the stars were known by, They're the actual name that we often give to the star. Now, here is the really embarrassing thing about proper names. People have been naming stars since ancient times. Different cultures named them differently. Different astronomers named them differently. Uh, everybody named the stars in a different manner. And so all these stars in the sky, uh, particularly the bright ones, have a myriad of names associated with them. Even certain, certain cultures, sometimes called the star one name uh, and then sometimes another name. So some of these stars have multiple names even within a certain culture. Uh, so it, 
uh, embarrassingly, it was not until 2016 that the International Astronomical Union, which is the, the, the International Organization of Professional Astronomers, the only ones that really can name anything officially, uh, 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 came up with an official list of proper names. And they had like 120 something names in it. Uh, and then after a couple revisions that, you know, came up to, uh, by, by 2019, came up to 336 official names. There's, there's something close to a thousand common names of stars. So a lot of star charts you look at will have a name that's not one of those official names. Uh, and then sometimes you would have like an old star chart that had one common name, but the IAU picked a different name as, as the official name. And that, that actually happened to a couple of my favorite stars that, that I really liked. And they picked one name versus another name, and even though they were both equally utilized. About half people use one, half use the other. And uh, uh, in Stellarium, if you click on a star, it will give you the proper name if it has one. And sometimes it gives you two proper names. It gives you a proper name and then in parentheses another proper name. And that's because there's one official proper name and yet there's another name that's very, very commonly utilized. Problem is that even in ancient times, not even ancient times, but you know, hundreds of years ago, when they looked at proper names, they realized this was not an unambiguous way of naming uh, stars. And so what they did was uh, a fellow named Johann Bayer uh, comes along, and he comes up with a way of designating stars within a constellation with a two-part designation. The first part of the designation is a Greek letter, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, you know, A, B, C, D, E in Greek. Uh, and the second name is what constellation it's in. And so uh, this Bayer designation you know, was, was the way that he designated stars. And the Greek letter was roughly in order of brightness. So the brightest star was alpha, the second brightest was beta, then the third brightest was gamma. Okay, so Vega is the brightest star in the constellation Lyra, so it's called Alpha Lyrae. Okay, now Lyra, L-Y-R-A, you stick an E on the end because it's a second declension feminine noun, and that's the Latin possessive case, or the genitive case. Uh, Cygnus is a first declension masculine noun, so the brightest star in Cygnus, Deneb, is going to be Alpha Cygni. The, the, I, the, the U.S. becomes an I. Okay. The second brightest star is Alberio, which is Beta Cygni. Polaris is the brightest star in Ursa Minor. Uh, uh, Ursa Minor, that's a third declension noun, so it's Alpha Ursa Minoris. Uh, Rigel is the brightest star in Orion, so you expect that to be Alpha Orionis. Well, Bayer goofed. He instead calls that Beta Orionis, and Betelgeuse he calls Alpha Orionis. Okay. Um, still, in the Greek alphabet, Alpha, Beta, Gamma are the th first three letters. So if you have a star that's Alpha, Beta, or Gamma, it's one of the bright stars in that constellation. When you're, when you're looking at stars, you can, and I say, what's the Bayer designation? Don't just say Alpha or Beta because there's like 88 Alphas because there's 88 constellations. There's 88 Betas because there's 88 constellations. You've got to say what constellation is Alpha or Beta of. Rigel Cantaris, almost as bright as Rigel in Orion, and um, so a lot of people refer to it by the Bayer designation, Alpha Centauri. Uh, now that's actually how you normally refer to it, so you don't confuse it with the other Rigel. Okay, and and that's important because Rigel is a very important star in in Orion. The Rigel Cantaris is a very important star. Because it's the closest star to the sun, the closest star outside the solar system. It's only about four and a third light years away. Now, astronomers are going to be a little bit lazy here. And so rather than writing out all this complicated thing that I have right here, we use a lowercase Greek letter and an official three-letter abbreviation for every constellation. It's not always the first three letters. Uh, for example, Ursa Minor, there's Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, so it's capital U, capital M, I. You know, likewise, uh, for Canis Major or Canis Minor, it's CMA or CMI. Okay, there's two constellations that start with SAG. There's Sagittarius and there's Sagitta. So one of them is SGT and the other one is SGR. 
And so we got two different, you know, things there. So it's not always the first three letters. But if you want to know how does this all work, on the useful handouts page on Blackboard, I have given you a list of all 88 official constellations the genitive case of all official constellations in case you actually want to write it out the long way and or if you actually want to pronounce it the right way uh, and the official three letter abbreviation for every constellation and just you know and for cakes I also said what the constellation is supposed to represent Sagittarius is an archer it's actually a half man half horse to centaur archer okay but but anyway but but I, I gave, gave a brief description of what it's supposed to represent uh, and I've also posted for you uh, a list of the 88, uh, or not the 88, not the 88 comes, but I've also posted a list of the Greek alphabet for you in case that you would like to 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 be familiar with that. Uh, so this is what we call the Bayer designation of a star. And so uh, all the stars that have out that have proper names also have a Bayer designation. Now up until 2016. Astronomers really preferred to use the Bayer designation for star names because there was no official uh, proper name for stars. So that the whole idea was we wanted to have a way of uniquely designating a star, and since there was no official proper name of stars, then what we did was we used this because this is official and is very much unique to the star. And so that, that's the idea. That's why the Bayer designations were important. And even though I posted this on Blackboard, here is the Greek alphabet, alpha through omega. And so the stars are roughly in order of their, their brightnesses. So an alpha, beta, or gamma is going to be a bright star in the constellation. A chi, psi, or omega is a dim star in the constellation. Some constellations don't have very many stars. And so after you get down to zeta, eta, or theta or something, you run out of naked eye visible stars. And so at that point, you just like stop. Okay. Other constellations have so many stars, you go alpha down to omega, and you still have more stars. Well, you know, for a lot of astronomers, you know, uh, for Bayer, he figured, well, I mean, those stars are so dim, who cares anyway? Uh, but later astronomers did realize some of those stars were interesting. So there's another way that we're going to cover in our next little lecture, how you deal with those stars that are too dim. But remember, you need both the Greek letter and the constellation that it's part of. Uh, in order to give the Bayer designation.